Okay, we're going to seamlessly get some chairs on stage, and um, I will just take a moment to introduce our afternoon speakers. We're really very, very pleased to uh, ask, and Nazir uh, Avsal has agreed to come and talk to us today. Now, Nazir, many of you will know, was the former Chief Crown Prosecutor for the North West of England and has been involved in very, very uh, many cases. And the one that most of us will remember was the very sad high-profile cases in Rochdale in terms of child sexual exploitation and the gangs and the grooming. But Nazir actually has got a massive portfolio and his influence is one of those that stretches to many areas and he works in the areas of violence against women and girls, child sexual abuse and honour-based violence. So it is with great pleasure I'd like to introduce Nazir to the stage. Now I see you. Uh, good afternoon to you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Very shortly, in fact, I'll introduce them now because they will be speaking shortly afterwards. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Abby Billinghurst uh, and from Lucy Shuker and James Hatton. I'll introduce you formally when you come on. Do you want to sit, take your seats there? Um, and they will be speaking after me, and they'll also be involved in the open forum that we will have, uh, where you will have an opportunity to talk to us. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I, uh, I do feel like a fraud, really, because what do I know about young people? I've just prosecuted bad guys for 25 years. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you said I was the former chief prosecutor. I was the former chief executive of the Police and Crime Commissioners, and I'm the former husband to two wives. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but nobody puts that in my biography for some reason. Um, I'm, uh, yes, uh, people probably know me most, I suspect, for the Rochdale case. Who, who saw the BBC film Three Girls? Just give me a, a feel. And um, uh, the actor who played me, as you know, was much more handsome than I am. Uh, and in fact, my wife has a picture of him on the wall rather than one, <laughs> rather than one of me. Um, but I'll talk more about that uh, very shortly. Uh, my experience, uh, 25 years of prosecuting or thereabouts, has been, uh, and the one of the reasons I left, and Claire will know this because she, she and I worked together, uh, was because I was bored. I was bored and I was also frustrated that people were coming into the system, being dealt with, going out, coming back into the system, being dealt with, going out. Uh, and every prosecution, I keep saying this over and over again, is a failure because somebody has been harmed to get to that stage. And surely what we should be focusing on is what you're doing, which is preventing harm. And I was seriously impressed by Noel. Noel came up to me beforehand and said, you know, I was one of his heroes. Well, you know, I just heard Noel speak. I know how much of a hero he is. I wish my children uh, would grow up to be a bit like Noel, without the youth offending, of course, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> I would appreciate that they had his motivation and his inspiration uh, and were able to motivate you, as I'm sure, I'm sure he has done. When, um, when, I, when I prosecuted the Rochdale case, and I'll come to that in a moment, people have always focused on, some, as if that's the only type of criminality involving uh, child sexual ex abuse and exploitation. We know uh, that the vast majority of children are abused in the family, and we've lost, perhaps lost track of that. Um, we also know that the second largest number of victims would be online, and that is a substantial growth area. Um, you know, you, right now, for pennies, you can watch, a, uh, in real time, a child being abused in the Philippines for you. Now, that is the seriousness of the issue and one that we're only just beginning uh, to get our heads around. The third largest group of victims of child abuse are institutional. Now, we know about um, places of worship. We know about sports clubs. I mean, footballers are coming, coming to terms with it now. We know about, we know about um, schools. Uh, we know uh, institutions like BBC and Hollywood and all the rest of it. Um, that abuse takes place and has taken place for decades, if not centuries, and it has been brushed under the carpet or ignored or seen, taken, not, not taken seriously. And so that's, we have to remember that is the third largest group of victims that we, uh, we recognize. Then we come to street grooming, which is of the nature of the Rochdale case. Yet, if you listen to and heard the news for the last five years, that's the only type of sexual abuse of children. And that we have to remember and contextualize it throughout when we talk about that. When Rochdale happened, uh, you know, I'm conscious of the fact we're now 15 minutes running late, so I'll compress what I'm going to say. Uh, when we, when Rochdale happened, um, I moved to the northwest of England. I was previously director in London with, with Claire Toogood. Uh, and uh, when I moved there, I 
consciously asked my teams to provide me with any cases that they had of this nature which hadn't been prosecuted. Because I was aware of a phenomenal campaign being run by Andrew Norfolk and James Harding in the, in the Times newspaper, which had not really got the attention that it deserved. And uh, they came to me, my phenomenal team in, in, in Manchester came to me with this case, uh, which was called Operation Span, and which uh, had fallen in the gaps previously. So 2008, eight, nine, these girls, or one, at least one of them, had made an allegation to police. The police had carried out a very poor investigation. We'll hear from Jim later about how things have improved. A very poor investigation. Prosecutors made a very poor decision making. They reached the judgment that these girls were so chaotic and so troubled that there's no jury on earth that would believe them. Now, now, seven years on, we, all of us are going, what, what? But the reality is that is the culture that existed in 2008, 2009 and before. We sem somehow felt that it was too difficult to take these cases to court. Uh, and we needed to do the exact opposite. In fact, the, the reason why it, uh, it was so troubling was that the fact they were chaotic and troubled was the reason why we wouldn't prosecute them. But it was also the reason why they were being targeted by the offender. Because the offender knew that we wouldn't take them to court. And so they were doubly damned, as my actor said in my film. <laughs> I'm now quoting a fictional version of me. Um, um, such is life. Um, but we, they were doubly damned. And so it was within my, uh, it was so easy for me. People, say, people keep saying, oh, really brave decision. No, it wasn't. It was so easy for me to reverse the decision that had been taken not to prosecute and to bring that prosecution. But we need to do more than that. We need to provide support and services that were never there in place. I've heard people talking about tick boxing previously. We cannot just tick a box when you're providing support for victims. You know, they, they, these young girls and, and throughout all victims of child abuse need bespoke support. And that is challenging for agencies. One of the young girls in the Rossdale case, uh, the only way we, we could get her to court every morning was by the same officer, one liaison officer throughout the, the life of the case, would go to her where she was, put on a Disney film for her. She's a child, remember? She put on a Disney film for her, make her a bacon butty to get her to court. There's no protocol anywhere that says that's what you do. But that officer understood the person he was with, she was with. And that we have to remember. So providing that bespoke service, bespoke support, meant that we were able to get those young girls to court. And again, we had to make strategic decisions. There were 47 uh, victims that we knew of at that time, and I made a judgment that we only needed six to be able to prosecute all the men involved. Because we knew, and it was again working with you as agents, you were telling us that there, there was self-harm, there was suicide, there was all sorts of potential risks uh, if we went to some of the other girls. So we chose the six strongest in order to build the strong case that we did. And then this whole case and these whole issues have been hijacked by the far right. And so we had to go through far right demonstrations on a daily basis and deal with all manner of, uh, of, of abuse being thrown at us, none, never mind at, uh, at the perpetrators, to ensure they got a fair trial. And they got a fair trial. Now, I, don't, I will never forget May 2012 for good reason. Uh, and for bad reason. Good reason uh, that we were able to convict the men of that abuse and that the world suddenly woke up to this issue and then people wanted to do something very different in terms of the prosecution of this type of crime and the, and the investigation of this type of crime. The bad news was that I got it personally in the neck. Now, I got it personally in the neck from the Prime Minister who wanted me to give him all the answers <laughs> and explain what was going on. That's a different story. But the far right's narrative is very straightforward, ladies and gentlemen. Their narrative is that all minorities are the same. And so when they discovered that actually it was a member of a minority that had brought the prosecution, I damaged their narrative. And I was the very first example for me of fake news. They created websites and all manner of online activity to suggest that I was the one that didn't prosecute these guys five years previously, where I lived down south with Claire, rather than, not with Claire, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think her husband might complain. Um, but, I, you know, the fact is they were blaming me, and they did blame me, and their ignorant followers went for it big time. I had, uh, I had to have a police uh, officer outside my home for two weeks. My children had to go to school by taxi for a month. It was the only safe way. I had a panic alarm placed in my house. My wife had a breakdown. I had 17,000 emails sent to my address at work uh, calling for me to be sacked and deported. I come from Birmingham. I don't want to go back there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
nobody in Birmingham. I love Birmingham, by the way. It's just, it's just, it's just a joke. But they went for me because I damaged their narrative. And I, I, I had to then do more than that. I had to try and identify what caused this type of behavior. And so I was writing articles in The Guardian and other newspapers, and I was calling for, I gave evidence to Parliamentary Select Committee, Home Affairs, and said, can we have some research in this area? So I'd love to hear from what Lucy has to say later. Because we are short of research in this area to understand what's going on, why these perpetrators do what they do, why does the victims are, are let down so frequently. And people used to say to me, oh, it must be political correctness, or it must be a conspiracy of silence, or whatever it is. My reality it was, it was incompetence. It was incompetence, and it was accepted by every serious, serious case review I know. In part, those of you who've read SCRs, which I'm sure is all of you, recommendation one is always people do not share information. Yes? Always. And time and time again, we go back to the reason why that happens. We do not understand the Data Protection Act. The Data Protection Act is there to protect the person about whom the information is held, not the organization. And so we don't share. And because we don't share, people, the jigsaw is not complete, and that victim continues to suffer until such time as we get an SCR. We've got to learn from this. We keep saying, oh, we've learned lessons. Well, you know, there's a legal phrase for that. It's bollocks. You know? <laughs> I put it bluntly as that. You know? We have never learned lessons. We do not get it right first time. And we need to get that level of training and awareness out there so people really understand this issue and really understand the nature of what we're dealing with. Because perpetrators will get in the gaps. They always get in the gaps. They are better than us at getting in the gaps. And we are not able to provide that level of support that we need, we need to do. I went back, you know, when, when, when we were in London, CBS London, we dealt with Baby P, uh, the prosecution of those who harmed Baby P or killed Baby P. And the reaction to that needs to be recognized. We decided as a nation that we would introduce a bureaucratic process, a bureaucratic process by which uh, People would no longer use their judgment, we would tick boxes. No tick box has saved anybody's life, ladies and gentlemen. We then, we, then found, we then found that in the year afterwards, social workers left the profession in droves. We then found the year after Baby P's death, more children were killed by their parents than ever before. Success. You know, clearly, what's the key outcome here? Well, we decided that something bureaucratic without involving judgment would be the most effective way. And the only thing I can suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is black box thinking. The only industry I think gets it right, subject to Monarch and other organizations, is black box thinking, is the airline industry. Because they require everybody, whether you're the person carrying the wheelchair or the person flying the plane, to report any concerns. No blame culture. We want to hear from you what's not going right, and then we, will act, we have to act upon it and tell you what we've put right. And we need to reduce that kind of culture throughout child protection, throughout violence against women and girls, throughout criminal justice, you name it. But at the moment, we still look for a head. We still look for blame where we shouldn't look for blame. Now, I'm conscious that time is running out, so I'll focus, if, you, if I will, on Stuart Hall. I prosecuted Stuart Hall. Some of you recall uh, Stuart Hall. And, He's one of the reasons why I left, actually, because when you're dealing with a CP prosecuting, you have the same evidence, but names change. I prosecuted Stuart Hall twice in one year, so even the names weren't changing. And <laughs> what Stuart Hall, as you, as you recall, was, was um, there were 13 victims of Stuart Hall, well, 13 people who came forward, and he was convicted of 12. He pleaded guilty to 11. He was convicted by a jury of one, and he was found not guilty of one. And I had to go and see the one that he was found not guilty of. And I went to her, and I said to her, I'm really sorry that I couldn't give you closure. And she said, the moment you believe me is when you gave me closure. And that has never left me. And that's where it starts. It starts with you. People used to attack me. The Daily Mail particularly used to call me witch, witch finder general, you know, as if I was prosecuting people on the basis of somewhere on a witch hunt. No, we had a situation where we were acting less than zero in the past. We were always cynically, sarcastically, looking at any allegation made to us, as we're doing right now. Any woman that makes an allegation against a celebrity, what was she wearing, why was she in that room, why didn't she report? Any man, it must be true. You know? So we still operate in that same way, where we don't believe, where we act on a less than zero basis. If you don't act, start off on the basis of belief, then we're in a very bad place. And that's how you build cases. And that's how you work together in investigation. And this is where collaboration comes in. After Rochdale, I became a lightning rod. And loads of people were um, emailing me from around the country, all sorts of agencies, organizations. I remember one in particular, because I, say, I raised this with the permanent secretary at uh, uh, DFE. A school nurse emailed me to say that she had in her care a child that was being sexually abused in her school. 
but she didn't tell the school because she was employed by the health service. Now, it's shocking to you. It's shocking to me enough for me to report it. But that's what we're up against. Silo working, no collaboration, data protection, everything else that you can possibly think of. And we've got to get around that. Because ultimately, it is about the protection of the child, and no more and no less. As I said, there is no conspiracy here. This is about better working, or poor working in the past, and better working going forward. The answer, ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, is education. Well, I'm not here to provide you with the answers. I will, I will tell you, though, that by doing relationship education, by giving young people the, to recognize what a good relationship is and what a bad relationship is, by giving young people all the tools they need, that's how we will deal with this. And we miss a trick, because too much of our effort is placed on 12 to 16, when it's 5 to 12-year-olds we should start at. There is research, isn't there, that shows at the age of 3 or 4, you know a propensity to violence of a child. So the earlier that we can work with young people, and it's got to be age appropriate, that when we talk to them about what they may be suffering, we talk to them about what they should be doing, we talk about equality, gender equality, and what, you know, what a good relationship is. These young girls, one of the young girls in Rochdale, throughout the trial, kept calling the defendant, one of the defendants, her boyfriend. She knew no different. She thought that was a relationship. But we've got to put that right. And we struggle here. I gave, again, another bit of evidence I gave to Parliament. I said there was a production of Oliver that was going around schools in the southeast of England. You know what happens to Nancy in that, don't you? Right? We decided, or the school and the governors and the various playwrights decided they would rewrite Dickens. They rewrote, they rewrote it because the children should not be exposed to that in their little production. Yet one in four of them go home to experience it. By wrapping them up in cotton wool, we're doing nobody any favors. The safe environment with the school is where they need to have this conversation. And what we need to do differently, ladies and gentlemen, is follow the victim's journey, because then we can find the way where we can intervene. And my career, 20 odd years ago, started by understanding what the victim's journey was. I remember a woman, I'll leave you this thought, a woman coming up to me and saying to me, and I noticed that she had her wedding ring, not on this finger, but on the opposite finger of her hand. I said to her, why are you wearing your wedding ring on the wrong finger? And she said, it's because when I was a child, they forced me to marry the young, wrong man. And I looked at her and I thought, she has a life of hopelessness, of despair, of daily rape, of everything that could possibly go wrong in her life. And that is her protest, because she didn't have a voice. I made it my responsibility, as it is your responsibility, to be her voice. Thank you. On a lighter note, no, uh, <laughs> I don't know how you follow this. Um, 